Bart Ross St. Clair. You can just call me Bart Ross. Yes, that's my real name. I also do the Amateur Academic, which is trying to promote open science and citizen science just for everyone. Uh, you know, you can always contact me on Facebook, Twitter, Quora, LinkedIn. Sorry, I don't have your platform. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can always contact me. Uh, and I really like to do a lot of outreach for citizen science uh, and just trying to get people out there to think a little bit more academically. That's why it's called the Amateur Academic. And that's actually, I put my research out like that. And uh, that, that's what I do in my spare time. So what, what is a mathematical theory of knowledge? Let's start off with the question, why? Why do we need a mathematical theory of knowledge? Well, the quick answer is, of course, artificial intelligence. Machine learning, knowledge extraction, and building a knowledge engine. Think about Google 2.0 here. Think about being able to, to write to a search engine and then it makes a personal Wikipedia page just for you. That's a knowledge engine. And how will that be done? I mean, what will we be doing with that? Well, two really great examples of research with open science, for example, or commerce with open AI. You could have an AI platform running in it. And, you know, there's no reason to compete like we were hearing before. There's just no reason to compete here. So let's all work together. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm going to be putting out this research uh, mathematically uh, with machine learning, uh, with a lot of different things. And you guys can just use it. You guys can call me. You can contact me. You have my information. Let's all work together. There's no reason to have different competing projects here. It benefits everybody. So basically the structure is, of course, knowledge on the blockchain. That's what we really want to do. I think it's a great structure uh, to store and process knowledge uh, and do this machine learning and knowledge extraction from machine learning. So, of course, the first question is the big question. That, you see, that's why the text is big. Oh, it, it's funny. Okay, good. Uh, what is knowledge? Okay, that, that's a difficult question. A lot of people in philosophy and stuff, they've been asking this question for thousands of years. So I'm here right now saying I have an answer for that, like many people over the years. And um, it's an axiomatic theory. The problem is, like I said, I can't do the math because a lot of people don't understand it and I like, have like 15 minutes. So this is a, that's why I stayed up to like 3.30 last night trying to figure out what the hell I was going to tell you guys. So let's, let's start with a question here, another question. Why don't we remember everything we experience? Why don't we remember everything we see, hear, smell, touch, taste? Why don't we remember everything perfectly? Resources. Limited resources, yes. So, axiom one, knowledge is a compression of observations. Mathematically, I'm trying to translate this stuff here, but I would say uh, to translate this into English, knowledge is a compression of observations, more or less. So, question one. What is an observation? That's a good question, right? An observation can be data, correlations, all kinds of stuff. Just anything you observe, anything you record. So how are observations compressed? Question number two. Very valid question, I would have to say. Um, without going into the mathematical gory details, which, by the way, if anyone wants to know, just contact me or in the breakout session with James over here, we'll, we can talk about that. Answer two. Compression is performed by finding generalized atomic structures to describe more specific observations. What the heck does that mean? When I talk about atomic structures, I'm talking about atomic algebras, not uh, like physics atomic things here, which I also do sometimes. Um, it's about finding the most generalized description of something for fitting more specific examples. So that way you don't have to store all of those examples. That's compression, right? So, let me give you a good example of this, the ansatz. You know, I, I've taught a lot of people math over the years, from children, adults, university, uh, school, all kinds of stuff. I love math. Sometimes math loves me back. And the ansatz uh, is something very difficult for people to understand. People want to mathematically solve a specific problem with a specific solution. And the whole point of math is to try to group problems together so that you can kind of solve them generally with an ansatz, with an assumption that you can then just plug everything in and go, oh, that's the answer. And people like to solve things very specifically, but that's not really the way to solve problems. It's to find a more general solution and then apply that to your specific problem. So that's why 
compression. So, axiom two, observations are described as information. So, what is information? We hear a lot of times information this, information that, uh, everything from uh, Shannon's theory of communication, great, I think it was 1948, uh, really great information, entropy, probabilistic, uh, all the way to uh, modern information theory, which talks about algorithmic information theory, all these wonderful things, but it doesn't really fully encompass the idea of information. And so, simply put, information is an answer. It's an answer to a question. The question are the probabilities, uh, possibilities that is, don't confuse those two, very bad. And trying to find an answer for that. Now, one thing I'd like to talk about here is uh, Professor Kola's Algebras of Information, a New and Extended Axiomatic Foundation. Love this. This is it's a, it's a huge weighty. Oh, I think I've got it in the trash can here. Sorry, Professor. Um, it's it's huge. It's like how many pages is this? Like this is just this guy writes. He doesn't know a lot about compressing. I think uh, information. Although he knows everything about information, he can't compress it. So uh, no offense to him. I love him. He's like a hero of mine. I wish I would have found his stuff earlier. That's another problem. Is finding information, finding knowledge, and you know we have a real difficult time and. I had to figure out a lot of this stuff by myself because I couldn't find his theory of information, his algebraic information theory. I really wish I would have found that like two years ago. It would have made everything really simple. Uh, I have my own notation. He has two types of notations, uh, both labeled and domain free. I really highly recommend checking it out. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing, I am. I don't know about you guys. So let's go to axiom three though. Knowledge is measured by truth, belief, and information content. This is also measured for inferred causality. This one kept me up. I was really wondering, how do I explain these measurements? These are the only mathematical measurements to people without any math. That's really difficult. But I, I made an effort last night at 3 in the morning. and uh, In the future, what we'll do is we'll, we'll have some really great knowledge diagrams for everyone um, in the paper. So then people can start making knowledge diagrams so you can see how that works. So question four, what makes an observation relevant? What's the difference between a relevant observation and an irrelevant observation? Patterns, uh, or that it answers a question, generally, it's relative, you could say. And how is this performed? Well, through probability and possibility, mostly. So that's, that's how that works. And when we talk about probabilistic truth, we're talking about divergence from the ideal distribution, information entropy, these sorts of things. You can, you can define truth probabilistically pretty easy. Now, now Professor Colas, he doesn't, although probabilistic information is considered an information algebra, uh, he doesn't like uh, this type of uncertain information, but although it, it does fit his uh, mathematical concept of an information algebra. I, I don't really understand why he doesn't like it, but he doesn't like it. But I do. I think it's great for knowledge. You have to have it. And of course, the degree of truth, which is of course class membership possibilities, such as when you have a clustering and you have, for example, uh, a fuzzy lattice or something like that, you can, you, can, you can try to put together how far away the distance uh, of, of this measurement of, of, a, of a class, which uh, is, is, is really helpful also for measuring truth. Now, finally, what is information content? That, that's, a, that's a tricky one. But uh, uh, Professor Colas came up with a really, really great, easy definition, which you can write up ma at whiteboard, mathematically, uh, which is basically you say in, in, in the English language, the information content of a piece of information is equal to or greater than another piece when it describes the other piece. Now, if you, would, if you would combine one piece of information with itself, the information content does not go up, of course. If you combine it with a part of itself, it doesn't go up. If you can take some sort of piece of information and describe another piece of information with it, it is equal to or even greater than the informational content. So it's relative. All these are relative. Knowledge is a relative thing, and we can show that mathematically. And so... Finally, of course, then what I suggest we should do with the breakout session with James here is, of course, knowledge on the blockchain. We actually take that 
and we connected machine learning with knowledge extraction. There's some really great papers that came out in the late 90s for knowledge extraction, which when we apply modern methodology to, we can really improve. The, the computation back then wasn't that good. Uh, you know, it, 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 was, it was very difficult. We really improved mathematically our algorithms, and we can apply that to knowledge extraction of machine learning whether it's neural network based or you know, with, whether you're doing some sort of clustering or whatever you're doing, probabilistically, possibilistically, we can really apply this and we can find a mapping that preserves the probability or whatever and actually extract out more of an AI based, uh, 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 rule based AI, and which I think is, is really important. And it's somewhat like, a, it would be like a very complex uh, expert system. And that would then be, uh, processed and stored on blockchain. And then everyone can just have access to this, whether you, 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 you want to do it as a company, whether you want to uh, do this for open science, o open AI, whatever you want to do with this. There's no reason why you can't connect it all together. And I think that was what I really heard here today from all of you, is that you really want to bring all this together. And it seems like people don't want to compete anymore, they want to work together. And uh, it, it's so great to hear that. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone very much. Like I said, I do the Amateur Academic. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Quora, even LinkedIn. Yeah, that's what I do. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, just ask me. It's always good.